The blood of this horse is killing me. Blood for Dracula, directed by Paul Morrissey and produced by pop art pioneer Andy Warhol, is a surprisingly moving portrait of Bram Stoker's vampire lord and has the hallmarks of exploitation cinema filtered through a narrative of genuine pathos and social commentary. In the early 1920s, a sickly Count Dracula, desperate for virgin blood to drink, travels to Italy to meet the aristocratic De Fiori family in the hope of marrying and feeding upon one of their supposedly virginal daughters. Udo Kier stars as a decidedly feeble take on the title character. From the very beginning, Dracula is portrayed as wistful and apprehensive about his prospects, not to mention frail, and this humanizes the monster in a similar way to Jim Jarmusch's Only Lovers Left Alive, one of my favorite films of the year. This Dracula is slowly starving to death, and is clearly sad that his beloved sister must be consigned to the crypt to avoid starvation herself. At once noble and pathetic, Udo Kier infuses Dracula with astonishing depth. Even though Dracula is a literal predator, you can't help but feel sympathy for him as you watch Kier's anguished, tenacious, and staggeringly vulnerable performance. Udo Kier is the centerpiece of a slightly scattershot movie. I concentrate when I'm watching films, but even so, I found the De Fiori sisters hard to tell apart as their acting is unmemorable, and the middle sisters, Sophira and Rubinia, are basically interchangeable. As Dracula works through them to find a suitable meal, the film also feels too much like a checklist. The film is also generally a little slow and distracted, with too much focus on the girls and not enough for my liking on Dracula. But still, I really enjoyed Blood for Dracula. The music is elegant and somber, the costumes and sets are beautiful, Arno Uring is delightfully crafty and enterprising as Dracula's servant Anton, and the film's moments of gore are over the top while still being poignant. The film also addresses some intriguing themes. In its bitter confrontation of Marxist schools of thought, neither bourgeoisie or proletariat is portrayed in a flattering light, but Dracula sits somewhere in the middle. The De Fiori family represents the aristocracy attempting to prolong its existence. The hot-headed laborer Mario, Joe D'Alessandro, embodies the resentful working class waiting for their oppressor's downfall. And while Dracula is another aristocrat trying to survive and remain, he is aware that his class's days are numbered. Much like the De Fioris, Dracula's title carries little worth now. It is implied that his reputation has left him feared and avoided, with Anton and Mario as the only remaining servants of their respective employers. Dracula laments his slim chances, and his mood becomes even more desolate when the middle sister's impure blood poisons him, and reacts with longing regret when the eldest daughter, Esmeralda, informs him that she was once engaged, and Dracula takes that to mean that she isn't a virgin. You share Dracula's veiled disappointment because he clearly admires her for her intellect and poise, not just as a possible food source. Of course, she later turns out to really be a virgin. Vampires have always been a very erotically charged monster, but they have also represented the parasitic aristocracy exploiting and bleeding dry the lower classes, especially in the wake of revolution. But Morrissey skillfully deconstructs this cultural perception, and not just through Dracula preying on other aristocrats. Dracula is clinging to the old ways, even as class loses its relevance and faces growing opposition, overtly symbolized by Mario, and increasingly liberal attitudes towards sex, not so much in the 20s, but definitely during the 70s, when the film came out, make the old ways, and himself, obsolete and struggling to endure. And Dracula knows this. Though he and Mario disagree, at least they can hold a conversation. And when Mario indicates that he waits, rather than dreams, for the upper classes to be taken down, Dracula's response of, I have heard that before, has a note of resignation. Perhaps exacerbated by self-awareness of his own sickness, Dracula knows Mario is right, but doesn't want to admit it. This portrayal of Dracula as a dying breed failing to adapt adds further nuance to Udo Kier's remarkable performance. As for the proletariat, Paul Morrissey, who from what I've read seems like a conservative asshole, hates the class system but also hates socialism, hence the characterization of Mario. Mario, who has elements of a streetcar named Desire's Stanley Kowalski, is a truly repugnant human being, far worse than the literal monster that is Dracula. He is an angry, brutish rapist who regards the De Fiori sisters with a disturbing combination of lust and contempt. He is also a hypocrite. For all his obsession with Marxist literature and creed, and his hate for the aristocracy, Mario exploits the De Fiori sisters for sex and thinks he can boss them around, when a true Marxist society should have no privilege. I hate Mario, and the film wants you to hate him too. 
Morrissey probably intended for Mario to convey the fervor and rage that socialist ideas can produce, but to me, Mario illustrates the cruelty that some people inflict when they have an enemy of any kind. By the way, there's only one Mario I love, and it's Mario from Glove and Boots. Blood for Dracula is far from a perfect film, but it's a highly entertaining, compelling watch for Udo Kier's phenomenal performance, the absorbing themes, their inventive deconstruction of vampire lore, and the morbidly appealing presentation. Ultimately, Blood for Dracula earns three and a half stars out of five. Thanks for watching. Cheers.